Chapter One of London Impressions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lynn Lee. London Impressions by Alice Maynell. Chapter One The London Sunday. This seems to be a thing that all exclaim against, and but few see. The phrase is never varied, a sure sign of lack of experience. One cries, Oh, the London Sunday! and another it must be too dreadful for foreigners and before the topic disappears something yet vaguer has been said in a flickering manner as to the boulevards but in fact london sunday is little understood even by those who know its aspect and the greater number do not know even so much obviously it is one thing in the summer of livelong sunshine and another thing in winter when the tops of the steeples fly a blue and white sky as far as the eye may see a broad flag for the streets, and a narrow wavering pennon for the alleys, when the reluctant faces of grey houses are compelled by the fires of the day to bandy reflections with the grey houses opposite, when the sun himself is lodged in every window, so that the town multiplies his very face, and sets up suns to the west in the morning and to the east in the evening, suns in rows, and suns that run fluctuating along the windows of a long, unequal street, when the plane tree is fresh and the leaf of the elm already dry, the London Sunday, from beginning to end, is passed by the London people out of doors. For this reason it is difficult to understand it. You cannot tell whither these streams of people are bound. They all have the gait of making for some end. They do not stroll, and there is doubtless some excursion afoot. The number of young men, in proportion to the numbers of older men, of women, girls, and children, is curious especially in the further east they go in great straggling gangs and though they do nothing not even much talking they give a false air of lawlessness to the streaming street they are the ugliest of all the populace their clothing besides being the most dull and indescribable and their bearing indefinitely defiant the men of other kinds and ages and the woman who needs must balance such a horde of men of twenty seem to spend less of their sunday on the road and you may see them accordingly in great numbers in the open spaces the vague lands on the other side of clapton for instance very few people of any kind seem to be within their houses in the free afternoon in spite of the length of london you may pass from the furthest west to the extreme east and from the last country field to the first so quickly as to get a continuous sunday impression the day and the people flowing unfolding and closing from suburb to remote suburb through town through the city through the east and to the verge of breathless and unfragrant meadows divided by a league-long tramway line lost in the distances of epping whither the smoke from which a southwest wind has set all london radiantly free is trailing a broken wing even in the centre of the city it cannot be said that the main streets are deserted for they evidently are all thoroughfares towards the unknown places to which these thousands and thousands of crossing feet are bent but the secondary streets are swept and vacant and the effect of the absence of people is to turn the whole picture pale the asphaltic streets are almost white and in this light grey london colourless but clear you realise how much man darkens and blackens the earth in these latitudes by his mere presence the natural surface of the world it seems is rather blond than dark the quarry is white and the harvest bright with which agrees the delicate high and sensitive soft colour of the body it is a pity that mere black brown and grey dyes should so change the colour of the race squalid dyes in which are steeped the unchanged and the unwashed garments of these quite innumerable young men it may be noted that the great majority of the london sunday women are fresh to see we all know that there are alleys and corners where the women look otherwise but those who take their part in this sunday so famous in illusions who join in the day-long movement on foot and load the tram-cars are clean and cleanly clad in shoreditch and along the outstretching kingsland road the all-brilliant sun strikes flashes from white dresses and gilds fair hair attractively arranged this is one of the surprises of the journey another surprise is that you fall in love with the city steeples 
and find it dull to pass out of their influence of serenity and fancy to come amongst the gothic towers and spires of the suburbs these last are studious and consistent properly retrospective and full of principle and history moreover they are well seen for they stand in the wide dwarf town with nothing of their own measure except the board schools all the shabbier suburbs are dwarfs and none drop so suddenly and go so near the ground as the suburbs of the north-east but there are too many gothic towers whereas of the lovely spires of wren and of his followers we shall have no more no one it seems plots to recapture that signal inspiration so delicate so inventive so full of dignity and freaks nothing is quite so beautiful as the spire of bow but it must be permitted to admire a slender steeple in shoreditch and one close to the blue coat school the much less ingenious one by the post office even the prankish one near the mansion house besides the beautiful st mary's in the strand and the only less charming st clement danes and all these lily-like spires have kept more or less their paleness in the smirched and spotted town they are fine against all the london skies and never more beautiful than with a bright grey sky and the half sunshine of a characteristic london day on their happy little cupolas and small and exquisite columns except perhaps when a westering sun makes their white a golden rose st botolph's bishop's gate has but a squat spire set with flourishing little urns but it has many trees tossing in the summer wind and in its garden a fountain where the pigeons and sparrows bathe together across the geraniums and lobelias of another quadrangle full of sun and translucent shadow you may see the gold of the altar lights and white surplices gilded with that gold the tradition a dickens tradition it seems of the desolate city church is still true as to the members of the congregations in this open church there are but three people exceedingly devout but the old woman the beetle the gloom are gone there is one respect in which sunday flatters the town it fills with iron blinds and shutters the hollows of the shops whereby london usually looks as though the houses found a kind of helpless security in their long staggering lateral union a prop for houses that have lost their feet again it helps the summer to put out many fires and helps the live wind to sift the darkness from the sunlight End of chapter 1 The London Sunday Chapter 2 of London Impressions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. London Impressions by Alice Maynell. A Pilgrim now and then a firefly strays from the vineyard into the streets of an italian city and goes quenched in the light of the shops the stray and waif from the very country that comes to london is a silver white seed with silken spokes or sails there is no depth of the deep town that this visitant does not penetrate in august going in going far going through by virtue of its indescribable gentleness the firefly has only a wall to cross but the shining seed comes a long way a careless alien but a mighty traveller indestructibly fragile the most delicate of all the visible signs of the breeze it goes to town makes light of the capital sets at naught the thoroughfares and the omnibuses especially flouts the park one may suppose where it does not grow it hovers and leaps at about the height of first-floor windows by many a mile of dull drawing-rooms a country creature quite unconverted to london and undismayed this flaneur makes as little of our london as his ancestor made of chaucer's sometimes it takes a flight on a stronger wind and its whiteness shows dark with slight shadow against bright clouds as the whiter snowflake also looks dark from its shadow side then it comes down in a tumult of flight upon the city it is a very strong little seed pod set with arms legs or sails so ingeniously set that though all grow from the top of the pod 
their points together make a globe on these it turns a cartwheel like a human boy like many boys in fact it must overtake on its way through the less respectable of the suburbs only better every limb itself so fine is feathered with little plumes that are as thin as autumn spider webs nothing steps so delicately as that seed or upon such extreme tiptoe but it does not walk far the air bears the charges of the wild journey thistle seeds if thistle seeds they be make few and brief halts then roll their wheel on the stones for a while and then the wheel is a wing again you encounter them in the country setting out for town on a south wind and in london there is not a street they do not recklessly stray along for they use our arbitrary streets it does not seem that they make a bee-line over the top of the houses and cross london thus they use the streets which they treat so lightly they conform for the time to human courses and stroll down bond street and turn up piccadilly and go to the bank on a long west wind their strolling being done at a certain height in moderate mid-air they generally travel wildly alone but now and then you shall see two of them as you see butterflies go in couples flitting at leisure at charing cross the extreme ends of their tender plumes have touched and have lightly caught each other but singly they go by all day with long rises and long descents as the breeze may sigh or more quickly on a high level way of theirs nothing wilder comes to town not even the scent of hay on the morning winds at market time in june for the hay is for cab horses and it is at home in the clattering mews and has a london habit of its own white meteor lost star bright as a cloud the seed has many images of its radiant flight but there is only one thing really like it the point of light caught by a diamond with the regular surrounding rays end of chapter two a pilgrim chapter three of london impressions this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by brian laszlo beauregard london impressions by alice maynell the effect of london it is no wonder if the painters of london are somewhat eager for the help of smoke a simple glance at the streets and the glance that would appreciate so mingled a sight as that of london must be simple shows you that the detail of our streets is the closest detail in the world nowhere else do the houses the carriages and the people all alike wear the minute spots of hard color that make a london street by bright daylight look so sharp and small in cities abroad, for instance, you find some blank spaces of wall on the fronts of houses, narrow spaces in the north, but wider and wider as you go south. In other cities is here and there a closing of the eyelids with a smothering of the faces of the streets. Here alone, the unshuttered windows are set close together. The street glances and chatters with the false vivacity of these perpetual windows. Shops and windows run into rows all but touching one another or what interval there might have been betwixt is, by the care of architects, in some manner harassed and beset. Add to this the black garments of the crowd, which make every man conspicuous in the light, and the abrupt and minute patches of white, exceedingly pure white of sharp shapes and angles, scattered throughout the drifting and intercrossing multitude. The white of a footman's shirt, the white of the collars of innumerable men, the white letters of advertisements, the white of the label at the back of cabs and hansoms, and many and many other little square, triangle, and line of white are visible to the utmost distances. They have an emphasis that is never softened. Nothing, except snow, could be whiter, and nothing, perhaps, makes so salient a part of the enormous fragmentariness of the street view. There might be as much detail in some other scenes, but that they have not these shreds of patches of black and white. Of all landscapes, for instance, that of the small culture of Italy, and of parts of the East, is perhaps the most minute. A little rill of vine is crossed by a short patch of corn, 
and among all the sprinkled foliage of fruit trees the olive with the smallest leaf of all is the most constant there is no liberty and your sight is taken in a net of green crops it is trapped on the ground by tendrils of cucumber and cannot rise because of maize and beans nor can it fly for branches no tract of grass is wide enough to make a space of quiet green and the eyes are kept busy by delicate things in perpetual interchange it is not the multitude of a wide clover field where one stroke of the breeze turns a million little faces of flowers eastwards for there is hardly any repetition but an unending obstruction nor can you see anything that is quite simple unless pushing aside a branch of fig tree with this hand and a bow of peach with that you lift your eyes to the indescribable simplicity of the distance of mountains or there is infinite detail in a thames side bank of woods between maidenhead and cookham when all the leaves are out and all still young the characteristic local green of beech alder poplar and ash all still unlike each other and undarkened every separate leaf faced with color and light and backed by mystery and shadow but yet neither this nor anything else in nature shows the innumerable minuteness of london in the sun the summer sun sends a peremptory summons to every patch of omnibus red or blue to every scrap of harness to all the broken inconsequent access all equal all divided and all leaping to light in regard to movement the scenery of the streets has no likeness to anything in nature clouds wing one way streams flow trees toss thrill and remain but the crowd moves all ways without ever changing its spots its dull violence of color and contrast summer and day make the streets impossible for the painter but the summer of london is most local and characteristic not only in the west when the scent of the mignonette and the recurrent click of the bearing rain and bit where carriages stand waiting are the very signs of town summer at the bank summer that gives to the walls of lombard street a faint hint of reflected light and fills at a glance ten thousand serried windows with the images of the sun if there is everywhere a lack of spirit and sweetness it is only that sunshine with every tree and every flower is converted to london and turns a londoner but such charm as there may still be in the touches of the sun are perceptible rather in the few streets that keep their ancient narrowness here there is precisely the possibility of that interreflection of sunshine and warm light from house to facing house which in its gentle splendor is the chief loveliness of the summer in southern cities where walls are here and there blank and tenderly colored reflected light is the beauty of shadows and really one may see a shadow faintly so transformed in the course of the delicate curves of city streets such curves are not in the wider streets they are beautiful apart from the chances and changes of light where they foster and many a narrow street leading to the right and to the left out of cheapside or some other of the central london ways takes curves as subtle as those of a swimming fish's tail otherwise london curves are distressingly ugly and dreary those of a crescent for example but as much as the crescent offends the light wave of a fish's tail street pleases the eye with its fine deflections a wave of this kind is frequent enough in villages but a certain height in the houses gives it all its character in london some of these alleys on one side at least also have the charm which is the rarest thing in town of a certain steepness in incline they dip as they waver with a motion that tells of a direction towards water whether in village or town there is sea or river a hidden mediterranean or a hidden thames at the level to which the sway and swing of the path will settle and throughout london the direction of streets seems to be a rather secret thing and misleading the sign of a town that has not been ordered as a machine is ordered but has felt its way like an organism slight tendencies convergences divergences lead the streets wandering and draw lines long astray old and forgotten causes have brought to pass the slight misgoing that first takes the streets apart old rights or the accidents of private liberty and what these began the chances of sequence have ended a mile astray doubtless besides the swing of the river has tended to set streets aflowing too but the downward fluctuation of little city streets towards the water is a briefer thing 
and as full of drawing as the upper line of a flexible fan foreshortened. The long straying streets are too vague for drawing. In these city lanes, too, there is some rest for the eyes from the infinite detail of the street, and even from the tyranny of windows. Only in their warehouses are to be found spaces of plain wall, but unluckily the plain wall is also black. End of chapter 3「Four of London Impressions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Brian Laszlo Beauregard. London Impressions by Alice Maynell. The Climate of Smoke. It is some little treason to a natural storm to admire too eagerly the mimic rack and menace of the paltry tempest of the smoke. Only by acknowledging the climate of London to be more than half an artificial climate, and by treating our own handiwork, the sky of our manufacture, with a relative contempt, are we excused from thinking the effects in any sense beautiful. Let us avoid serious words of description. The whirls of floating smoke that darken the sunset are lurid to no very grand purpose and the threat from even twice as many kitchen fires never would be terrible. It is a tale signifying nothing. Let us grant that there is now and then an effect of handsome grime, but there is no system in this scenery of smoke. What form seems at times to declare itself is bestowed by the light. The sun rules from a center. Whatever the circumference be made of, mist from mountain heights, or vapor from that series of successive fleeting solitudes, the ocean, or refuse from a million fireplaces, and from this reigning center his rays seem to compel a kind of organism. There is no chance medley where he rules, because of his long, distributed lights and straight, infallible, divergent shadows that pick off the points and pinnacles of a thousand distances. The lowering sun will not permit the smoke to show so shapeless, so lifeless, so unbounded as it is. He takes his place in the middle of a wheel and commands at any rate a mechanical order. Otherwise, and without a sun lowered into your picture, the smoke-mingled sky is the most unplanned in the world. It has no confederacy and no direction. Nothing leads, and there are no figures, no troops, no companies. There is no history nor approach. The smoke is helpless. It is perpetually subject to gravitation. No wind makes it buoyant and no electric impetus lifts it against a wind. It constantly and drearily drops, as you may see if you look against any London horizon. The minute shower that it carries never ceases and never lifts, but sifts down momently from the low sky into which the chimneys raised it at first. That one upward spring was all its life. Thenceforth it does not but drift until it is all shed to the last black atom upon the face of the town. And yet you may, twenty times a day in London, hear the smoke called cloud. Thunderstorms are announced as lurking in the heart of the powerless bosom of the smoke, and showers are threatened where there never was anything so fresh as a drop of rain. The puny darkness is supposed capable of lightnings, and out of the grime is expected the thunderbolt. The splendid name of the cloud is given to this poor local vesture of decay. No use or custom seems sufficient to make the London sky of mechanical suspension familiar to the citizen. When he faces it at the end of a brief distance, he calls it by the name proper to the celestial heights, and he is hardly convinced of the truth when he sees it walk his streets. But indeed, he might have learned long ago that there is no life in his storm, and that when thunder comes it wears a different gloom. The worst is that with the authentic darkness of cloud comes so often the imitation, and the town tempest is not only mocked, but hidden and covered by the pother of mere smoke, so that the citizen does not well learn to distinguish. But he who has ever really known the cloud will not make that ignominious confusion. He knows the difference in storm, and so much more the greater difference in sunshine. He will not call by name of cloud a thing that shows the dark shadow grimly enough, but never the light sweetly, and is naturally incapable of white. 
and yet the artificial climate of london is at its best when it is very obvious and when it has strong scenes of sunset or storm to deal with the time when it is insufferable is noonday or full afternoon on a cloudless day in summer when there is not enough wind to drift it helpless out of town and when it is not thick enough to keep the sun away it makes the sunshine ugly no beauty even artificial or obvious belongs to the smoke then and it plays no antic pranks in mimicry of cloud it has no shadow and no menace it has no opportunity for stage plays it is disconcerted and cannot make a penny theatre of its london every one must know such days of which the essence should have been their purity plain and splendid by their light is the smoke seen to be nothing in the world but a sorry smirch the horizon is thickened with it and there it wreaks its chief effects but all near things are also oppressed by it the spirit of the sunshine is gone and a blazing sun upon miles of blue slate roofs and yellow houses with the thin uncleanness of smoke just showing in the blaze is actually that impossibility sunshine without beauty after this let us grant the smoke the tragi comedy of its successes these are generally connected with westminster it finds matter fitted to its manner in the surrounding architecture and in the westward opening it suppresses a great deal that is not very presentable on the working side of the river and it reveals what is gothic on the other bank it has a trick of being ashamed of its origin for it hustles the long chimneys out of sight it does really surprising things with the beautiful dome of st paul's the very formlessness of its presence seems to give more value to that fine form it has a way of showing the noble tops of clouds while it loses their bases and vagueness which is not without beauty you cannot see from what heavenly ranges of highlands those summits tower and if they stand into the sunshine their isolation is more remote and splendid but even this is but a handy bit of scene shifting it touches no more than the fancy there is another effect of the london climate besides the effect of sky scenery and that is the local color wherewith the characteristic smoke mingled with a little rain to make a general water color has painted the surfaces of the town in variants of black the citizen who unaware of such things as the quarter of the wind takes his umbrella for fear of the thunderous look of a tremendous smoke storm to leeward is apt to take the touch of soot for the touch of time nevertheless the two dark colors are quite unlike time is browner and has a depth in the tone whereas soot is grayer and at its blackest has no depth it gives a shallow color and even those who love their sky streaked and tumbled into the chaos of smoke should not be allowed to defend the aquarelle that colors their buildings it is true that we no longer offer columns of the doric order for treatment by london watercolors but all the doric columns we already have are left subject to this extraordinary substitute for the coloring of a laconic sun we have discovered that terracotta and tiles resist the work of the climate and no doubt london at a glance presents a less cold blackened face than it once wore but too much of the surface of london is still the work of that dashing impressionist the climate End of chapter 4chapter five of london impressions this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by eva davis london impressions by alice maynell the trees the high trees that stand stirring and thrilling in the squares in summer do taste of darkness night drives home a thousand shadows thin and subtle flocks to fold within the iron railings and to shelter in corners of the worn and unfragrant grass till morning but the single trees that have their roots under grey pavements and that breathe in the little accidental standing places of the wayside the railed-in corners left by the chance medley of london streets these have the strange fate to be in perpetual light they never are washed in darkness they never withdraw into that state and condition of freedom into that open hiding-place that untravelled liberty 
that wild seclusion at home that refuge without flight that secret unconcealed that solitude unenclosed that manumission of captives that opportunity of penelope darkness the leaves of the street side tree flutter bright emerald green through the whole night out of town the discoloring night of leafy summer that local color is never quenched as human blushes are quenched at night it rather takes a more conspicuous quality under the closeness of the electric light it is sharply green whereas the day has its mists and veils and may at times darken a tree nearly black by setting the sky alight behind it the night has none of these shadows the light of night is stationary and unchangeable and there are some solitary trees here and there that undergo the unshifting illumination at the closest quarters the light that knows no hours and makes no journey gleams near upon the motion of the leaves and glosses their faces it is beforehand with the twilight so that the dusk when it comes finds the place taken and it will not let the tree go until the light of day flows in fully and dawn is over the sharp green of the plane tree is never covered nor are the delicately sprinkled spots of the poplar leaves mingled and massed in these solitary citizen trees it is in the avenues and glades of kensington gardens that night has her way there amends are made for the common day by a double mystery not a tree is so much as to be known by name all kinds sigh together in the dark the mass is sombre and alive but betrays neither leaf nor colour as violently as the spirit of the woods was driven away through all the long daylight by the sound the breath the blackness and the stamp and seal of london which permit nothing visible not a blade of grass to go unmarked by the proprietorship of this despotic city so swiftly as the spirit of the woods was hooted and stared into banishment by day so quickly so intently and in such a union of multitude does it softly return by night solitude comes the movement of the forest comes and remoteness which by day must be sought where it abides comes at a stride to london and sits in the branches of the trees profound is the forest and august the sky whence the great and melancholy spirit of the woods comes to restore these daily altered elms look but at the avenue of the broad walk at night as it is seen from its northern gate some midsummer daylight hovers up in the sky but the coolness and purity of subtle light are subtly mixed with the thin brown that is the colour of london a narrow space of this sombre and delicate sky lies straight between the two masses of trees and they are unmarked unbroken by any single branch or twig astray the symmetry is absolute the wide pathway is one faint gray from foreground to distance close to you two sentinel trees one on either hand hold the gateway of the majestic avenue and these only are green on these only shines the gaslight of the road these two are among those london trees that never bathe in darkness you can see their branches and their leaves their soft encounters with the night winds and their articulate composure but you see none of such things in the high and dark mass beyond standing also precisely to the right and precisely to the left by day it is a london avenue and the grass and gravel are as it were disowned by nature but now this rigid pattern of a landscape is visibly in the heart and centre of nature and night no pilgrimage of days can take a traveller further than the places he is wrapped to by a pause at night 
where distance and dreams themselves have made the journey or seek the trees earlier in the night for the trees of kensington gardens are not deprived of the delicate dusk though the first twilight has too much of day in it and the touching restoration does not begin until the paths are vague and colour is absorbed and effaced by the influence of the local sky london passes away from the trees while the june northwest is still luminous but barely luminous and going out so fast that to watching eyes it seems to flash softly while it darkens as though summer lightning were at play under the horizon then the tender leaves of penetrable trees lightly apart in the treetops let showering glimpses of sky go through if on the other hand you turn your own face from the bright regions and take the leaves with the northwest upon them on no apple trees and orchards and on no olives in the south does the subsiding evening look more sweetly all is forgotten except the cool ablution of evening upon the separate leaves or if there is an early moon she is as sovereign a restorative as the dark itself she touches the high places of avenues within sound of the london wheels and they become as simple as tree-tops at verona but indeed the moon is plainly seen to bring this dignity and liberty from the simple skies all the world knows her to be like that lady of the poets who spoke to none that was not worthy because before she talked with men she knighted them with her smile it is one of the tyrannies wreaked by the electric light and the gas lamps upon the street side tree that they keep away from it the glimpses of the moon not only is secret darkness forbidden but the secret light is quenched the tree waves softly all night in the unaltering lamplight and the moonlight is killed upon its sleeves as to these lights of london lamps their beauty which is so great seems to depend almost entirely upon the sky see them as they glow in the long unequal curves that follow the subtly misleading directions of the streets of london and in all their brilliancy they make but a common show pretty enough but not beautiful but let any lamp or line of lamps come into visible relation with the sky any sky whether a mysterious night sky softly embrowned or a night sky swept pure by a west wind or the most ordinary grey of any average evening and the lamp has indescribable beauties i have seen a grey-blue sky at the earliest moment when street lamps were light at all and radiant against the light grey of its invisible and equal clouds an electric lamp has been reared an electric lamp of cold white light pure and keen and armed with intense and splendid arrows that would pierce day itself light grey sky and thrilling lamp together make or so it seems to me one of the most beautiful sights that eyes can see the most refined most severe and most exquisite this carbon electric light is so much disliked because no doubt it was generally seen under the glass and iron of a railway station seen with the sky it cannot but be seen to be most beautiful the golden lights electric lamps or gas lamps have the beauty of fire but the white lamp has the beauty of light the golden too however cannot be seen at their best but in one picture with the sky london at night has begun of late so to multiply her lights that they make all her scenery a searchlight suddenly draws the eye up to the chimney-pots sweetly touched they too on the westernmost of their squalid sides and to the unbroken sky and then at once the eye travels down its shaft revealing clouded air and here a puff of steam from some machine at work on the new underground railway takes colour 
on its curves or the searchlight makes the programme of a music hall to shine black and white upon the wall anon an advertisement is written in light and perpetually among the even progress of the carriage lights flit the lamps of bicycles and if from a heart of glowing lights you look into the streets you find them so filled with blue air that there is evident blue between you and the houses opposite the street corner tree has always the golden gas and the blue air upon it rains a sky that is not seen to darken for rain and you hear the drops silent elsewhere upon its open leaves End of chapter 5 The Trees Chapter 6 of London Impressions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. London Impressions by Alice Maynell. Chapter 6 Chelsea Reach. The worst of all reasons for continuing anything is that it is easily continuable. The Houses of Parliament have an air as though you could take them on along the river towards Chelsea without any necessity for stopping but that very suggestion prompts its own refusal. No man would hold this characteristic to be one that makes for the beauty of a design. What there is of a really fine building never prompted the wish that it were to be prolonged. And although an embanking wall is not the same thing as a building, yet of even an embankment it may be said that the fact that it is already very long is at any rate a poor reason for making it longer. When the thing is not altogether admirable, it would be hard to urge a better reason for making no more of it. This is worth saying, in consideration of a recent measure of improvement, directed against the last bit left of the Chelsea foreshore. The measure was urged on the plea of uniformity, which obviously has reference to the beauty of the bank. Therefore, when the protesters against the change were accused, as doubtless they were, of opposing it for reasons of sentiment, they might well answer that the county council also has reasons of sentiment. Le cas a ses raisons. The feeling for uniformity is a sentiment like another. While, then, uniformity is one of the reasons of the heart of a county council, the inhabitants of Cheney Walk are free to press the reasons of their own heart. The embankment stops short at its westward end, in the course of Cheney Walk, just below the place where the river leaves a little bend, which is an inlet, an incident of the long reach. Call the curve a gulf, and this is a little bay within it. The bay is a small, forgotten, abiding, unremarked shore, with a great deal of modern London, not only below it, but above it, on its further side that is, between it and the vaguest beginnings of the country. Nevertheless, it is not modern at all. It looks like the overlooked little bits of cottage, tiled cottage roof, and cottage front garden. There are to be seen forgotten in the roaring streets of Fulham, true bits of village in the depths of town, but in any case it is to go even though the gulf is saved. Let us say at once that there may be two intelligible opinions, as to the embankment at Westminster and Charing Cross. There is something due to the worldly dignity of a great city. The distinction of London was once that it was not a great city, but a great village. It was a little town, widespread, and until the raising of some of the best of the new buildings on the left bank, there is nothing conspicuously fine to contradict the village character except Somerset House. The great stations and the busy Gothic of the Houses of Parliament were not influential enough for this. Now, however, it is somewhat different. 
to buildings at least in the line of new hotels and offices seem good enough to make rules they are not of the dignity of somerset house but they will serve for a space then where they stand the village london is done away and only for a village london a london keeping its own distinctive character would a broken accidental muddy shore with its tidal rhythm of mud and wave be fit this left bank at least is for a space grand vial we cannot altogether grudge its embankment but if there is a mile of london village left and therefore of the most london-like london it is at chelsea the reason of the county council's heart even ought to confess thus much and the village character is in its vitality on the curving foreshore of this long reach a great part of the district near is a village of yesterday and mean enough but the riverside of wharf and barge and tidal change is a village riverside of long ago it is lowly enough not mean at all it is a scene of business as old as civilization manpower and horsepower and the movement of wind and water seem to do the greater part of the work among them it is a counterpart of spade cultivation on the jersey Catu, though this is all river and that all earth but both are simple the chimneys on the right bank are a long way off the gas works higher up are out of sight you can forget the great bridges downstream and looking towards the light the view is animating and as much as the thames flows here northeastward when you look to the southwest by chelsea reach in the early afternoon of windy spring you look at once towards the gates of light and the gates of the wind and the gates of the river there seems to be one sole spring and source in the day the way is beyond description open for the waterway is the flat of the world and everywhere else in london are houses here is a real horizon here you get the proportions of a great sky as you get the proportions of a great church when there are no benches on the floor to shorten them the clouds come upon the southwest wind of the early year a little cold with the strength of freshness and not with chill and give and withhold a hundred lights those who do not like the name of mud should see how these lights are answered by the floor of mud in simple silver and steel twice a day the motion of the wave is there twice a day the still shore with that cradling change go the changes of the boats and barges at the wharfs all is life but there is no colour except where you very dimly perceive that a sail is red as the sails are on the adriatic it is a view to teach painting and to teach seeing we have not such another school in london as chelsea reach if chelsea ever becomes grand Vail, too the shape of the river will be altered and the profile of that curve sharp and fine with masts against the west will be abolished there will be no beauty of tides no silver wet mirror no barges there is nothing quite like chelsea the spoiling of chelsea will not be the same thing as the spoiling of the country by pushing on a suburb for instance for in that case there is a country beyond only deferred but there is no Cheney Walk, no Chelsea, further up the river, or anywhere in the world of rivers. End of chapter 6 Recording by Greg Giordano Newport Ritchie, Florida Chapter 7 of London Impressions This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Eva Davis. London Impressions by Alice Maynell. The Spring. There is a splendid spring in town, and it happens to agree with the country spring as to the time of appearing. But it is another show, and of another spirit. The difference is curiously complete. It was, no doubt, to be looked for in the avenues, in the sward in the winding water and in the park generally considered as a landscape but how is the grass itself london grass not only in its acre of intense green 
but in the space of a square foot that might one would think be anywhere it is london grass the leaves the blades are london growth you cannot evade the spirit of place by shutting out the sky the railings the people or the gravel even if you go close and make acquaintance as a child does with the roots you are aware that it is not the grass of england that you have there but the grass of london the leaves of the trees have so vulgar a contrast in the black of stems branches and twigs that they are from the first obviously not the leaves of the woods they are all the better admired by many eyes for whom the modest contrasts of nature are not enough and you may hear the black and green of the parks praised for the same immoderate effect of colour but the grass has nothing to tell that tale of the london winter which the branch tells it is this year's it has no past it is innocent and answerable to the sun for merely its few inches of simple green it might be supposed to have the graces of an alien in london but it has them not at all it comes up a londoner you cannot be really intimate with it and when it puts up its little flower and your child brings it home to you hot from a clenched hand even then it has nothing nothing whatever of the fields you put it into water to flatter the child but even there given by that little alien hand and so isolated from its park and its railings it is unmistakably the grass of its own soil it manifestly could never have been romping with little young dandelions on the side of a village road or tossed by visiting winds scented with meadows the london spring is a good thing but it is another thing it is only because of the accident by which the real spring and the london spring appear at the same time of the year that they have come to bear the same name and even to be confused together by the insensitive a handful from the hedgerows twenty miles away a handful already half faded of mingled things at random grass and herbs not free from traces of white and warm rustic dust an authentic little heap from the real spring would show at once to all apprehensive eyes what the difference really is and yet there must be careless or worldly birds that do not know it otherwise we should not hear such songs from the remotest riversides sung within kensington gardens let no one pretend however that the bees are deceived or indifferent nor let it be said that the difference is superficial that is precisely untrue it is the likeness that is superficial and the difference essential the london spring is a brilliant image of the real spring it is fresh when the real april is fresh and when it grows dim you could match it with specimens from the country wayside nay soot and smoke themselves cannot disguise the real spring growth and make it look like the london that can easily be proved after two weeks in which you are unconvinced of may by the green and dazzling parks you will get the very thrill of may from a square yard of very young nettles and young weeds of many kinds seen from a railway carriage and touched with the railway dust there is cleaner grass by the speak monument but this that grows by the railway is out of town it is of another kind it is of the other spring somewhere past the suburbs the london spring had its frontier and this past the sun and sap dawned and rose with sudden authority and spring was real knowing how intimate is the sense of smell one might think that the absence of the scent of the earth might account for all the deep difference of london but it is not so for you know the real spring by mere sight still the lack of that fragrance is much the earth is home and the scent of it is the scent of infancy and home childhood knows it better than does the ploughman following the new furrow childhood has had it so near and has learned it once for all and will never be deceived nor will the man who has had a childhood near living earth he knows that the springs are two he knows for he remembers that he knew the spirit of the place that is an aura that lies near the ground it is a warm atmosphere that does not rise but breathes by little garden plots in corners it is the very spirit of rivulets and brooks 
lurks amongst the maidenhair that covers the fresh waters of mediterranean hillsides and amongst the gravel of old sunny garden terraces is so caught in moss that the air where moss grows seems to imprison it and passes quick into the nostrils of young children all low-growing flowers ground ivy and things that are not so tall as grass are entangled with the spirit of place low box hedges are intricate with it and with the spirit of antiquity because they are no higher than the heads of very little children whose hearts conceive antiquity and the genius of places they know the breath of the parks well what children know what they knew we have never forgotten and yet all the differences which they learned the difference between the weak odour of soot and the gentle odour of earth and the difference between the click of the bit and the sound of the bee are not the real difference between the town spring and the spring of the natural world they are mere signs and proofs the fact lies deep and close there are two springs end of chapter seven the spring chapter eight of london impressions this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by michael fascio london impressions by alice maynell chapter eight below bridge the first impression and needless to say the longest is that of the many miles of wharves compared with the few miles of embankments drives and of the holiday river generally not only have the black and brown warehouses the chimneys and the cranes possession of the whole right bank of the london thames but they also hold both banks of the lower thames through league-long reaches and noble curves and such changes of aspect sky and direction as renew the scene by the rule of the sky besides this slow variation of light in which the view wheels under the wheeling cloud there is no lack of variety along the dusty banks of the river of commerce the subsistence of height along the warehouses as the river draws further and further from the middle of london is an incident of continuous interest interrupted now and then but holding on persistently until the carrying river flows through a dark gabled low and long village towards the eastern woods and heights and the further fields of really old buildings wooden and small and in any conventional sense interesting there is little indeed but such as it is it takes the eye instantly looking along the swarthy unequal frontage of brick houses that are no houses somewhat as the biblia a biblia of charles lamb are among books you find the face of a single human little house its timber looking old delicate and pale among the bricks a limehouse harbour master's title is written across the face and it is in fact dwelt in propped in the serried row that has the sightless aspect of a barn there is therefore almost nothing of what used to be called the picturesque nevertheless the whole continuous line has far more approach to beauty than any street of handsome houses with columns and porticoes in the whole of western london moreover it is much finer than regent street for the form of the normal warehouses is anything but bad there is a good deal of plain wall which unless a building be in every way wrong gives dignity the windows are not too many and for a mile at once the general repeated form is that of a single gable and a flat front with this you cannot have anything entirely corrupt true now and then there is a region or a tract of buildings works these seem to be not warehouses that touch the extremity of possible ugliness and dreariness and are flat-roofed rectangular and without exaggeration black these are very few two or three at the most and all on the right bank otherwise the skyline of buildings is low broken pointed and very various low as it is it is always seen from the deck of a boat the very skyline 
From that low point of view the scene is made of river and boats, warehouses, and sky. Of the thronging town beyond, on either bank, nothing appears. You have got rid of streets, and with streets, of all the movement, the rattle, the people, the inland perspectives. The face of riverside buildings looks almost unbroken. It lets no glimpse pass through. There might be marshes or fields beyond. It is only by the map that you know these two dark banks to be the edges and hems of cities. The swarthiness, the darkness of the color, a brownish gray, is to be insisted upon, yet to none but a careless eye does the lower Thames seem all brown and gray. The dull hues are shot with one single prevailing color, red. Innumerable red-tiled roofs are seen as the turn of the river shows their dusky sides. Iron sheds are ruddled with the red that signs blocks of country sheep. Shutters are red over warehouse windows. This is a Sunday view. And everywhere are the red sails of Venice, dyed in the self-same dye, only differently lighted. Even when there is a difficulty in fixing the place of this negroid blush, it is perceptibly there. It is latent, even when no red sail rises between gray water and gray sky. It lurks in hollows and inlets so darkly as to be almost black. Then, suddenly, the scarlet of a huge black and scarlet steamer comes along and gives you the color without a shred of mystery, without charm, and with the most definite division. Besides the red, there is nothing that is colored except a stack of timber now and then, raw wood with precisely the colors of a wheat field in August, and the piled-up hay of a red-sailed barge loaded down to the water. These are not many on the Sunday River, but Sunday clears the colors by clearing the air. There is exceedingly little smoke. Its sign is upon the whole riverside. It has redrawn everything in black, as a child might go over a watercolor with his black pencils. But between you and the natural clouds there is nothing but fresh air, quick with the movement that seems perpetually to follow this gray waterway. Or now and then, at long intervals, a single flimsy puff of smoke comes between the mast and sky. It is brown, the steam is white, and the clouds silver gray, and through each of these three with a various gleam filters the flying sunshine. Sunday seals the faces of the barns and turns the key upon the leagues of wharves, but it leaves all the cranes and masts etched in their thousands upon the low horizon. These make the thicket of the Thames side, a deciduous, narrow wood winding east, southeast, and north, and standing everywhere in its brief winter of a day, having shed sails and burdens and put away noise. There is nothing in the handsome London of high houses so delicate as these lifted lances against the sky. Hop gardens or vineyards, or the slender rows of sticks that carry pea plants and beans in rustic gardens, make the same play with light, and let it through as fine a design. Here is nothing of the sharp black and white detail that is the most salient thing in London streets. Everything is painted softly. All the darks are dull. In a word, the scene is simple, and this the streets are never. It is simplicity, indeed, that makes all the buildings, except only the works above mentioned, more than tolerable. There are no advertisements. This means much to eyes too well used to those shreds and tatters of the wall. That commerce which makes so much paltry show in the West is here perfectly grave and quiet. It makes serious announcements, not advertisements of the things that occupy navies. You see pickles and other names that launch a thousand ships, written large over various landing places, and the names of the owners of warehouses are broad across their fronts. Or you are reminded how little you know of the affairs of the place by the frequent name of Sufferance Wharf among the cranes. It cannot possibly be said that this lettering is beautiful, but it is not nearly so bad as the lettering in the streets we know. Needless to say, 
you shall not see a scrap of gilding below bridge, except a momentary tawdriness near the pier of some excursion place, where there are unseen cockney gardens at hand, no gilding, nor white, nor any kind of blue. Seeing that bad blue is the worst thing in the far-off town of paint and pleasure, the dark and reddish riverside of work has here again one of its obscure advantages. The work, almost all pausing in this summer Sunday, is obviously, to judge by its instruments and ships, mainly the inhuman work of machines. Nevertheless, wherever there are boats, there is that arm of Hercules which is heroic, and therefore greater, though much weaker than the arm of iron. And even on this day you may see the toil of the arm against the mass of the heavy river, as two men stand to row their broad barge upstream. It is the most primitive contest, after all. Their figures strain back on the long oar until they are stretched nearly straight horizontally, before they slowly gather themselves and grow erect again. Nothing suits the river so well as the barge with its level load, flat as the water itself. Nothing a tiptoe there, but the very surface of the world reaching to the sea, and the long river feeling for that level far inland. The dusky voyage darkens, for the Thames turns towards the north. Anon it takes a pale grey splendour. The sky shines, and the delicate intricacy of masts that mar nothing of the simple view seems to be rather itself luminous than dark against the light. Flying birds are lost as they pass in the upper brilliance. It is but that the Thames has swung towards the south again. End of chapter 8「Chapter Nine of London Impressions. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Greg Giordano. London Impressions by Alice Maynell. Chapter Nine the robes on westminster bridge at early morning wordsworth thought of the heart of london but a view of london in the long day and night of movement when the mystery of sleep is away suggests not the involuntary heart of men but their wilful feet the roads which are lonely messengers in the far-off country crowd together here and hustle one another to give footing to the tramp of the people London has a fantastic look, as though there were nothing to do but make haste to be gone. To look at London from some point of height, a rare opportunity, is to trace these ways of passionate escape. The roads, indeed, seem eager. But you know that the crowds who, by these curves and knots, these straight lines and these intent, narrow, dark grey levels, traced with narrower steel, elude the town are in no more than jog-trot haste, and wear no look of fugitives. Of them and of their detail there is no sign in this distant prospect. The movement of the people in London is here no more perceptible than the molecular motion in a diamond. But the roads are all expressive of this energy of flight from a centre. They are, as it were, signs of a perpetual explosion. They are on the fringe of the melee, the shooting streaming outbreaks of the photosphere of london they hunt and are hunted they fly from the city of confusion it is only by escaping that they become visible and out of the uncertainty of the smoke the hasty roads clear themselves as they make for light and the open ground it seems as though the steady strength of their curves did in itself express some force and impulse the railways run their foreshortened sweeps and reaches look like the swinging and swaying of a resolute motion. The town would shoulder them, but they evade and slip through, slender and keen, with a stroke of their flying heels. They crawl, but they crawl with the dominant level and liberty of flight and air. They begin in the tangle of the town, 
but smoothly untie themselves and pass away single and swift no other road looks so resolute in flight as the rail the others jostle one another as they hurry from town and must needs relax their eagerness in order to climb the hills brief and little ones though these are the roads pause on the mounds they hesitate at crossways and they dip into slight and shallow valleys whence they do not see the riot of walls and roofs from out of which they go the azor june hardly leaves a trace of the local gray of smoke all by some accident of aspect is a vaguely blue although the smoke seen from the greenwich heights leaves nothing unveiled cancels the horizon and barely lets the lovely dome of st paul's show a dark blue form upon the close background of thick and sunny air and blue like the rest is that one wide road which takes here so majestic a sweep the river it is the river of chimneys they stand on either bank as unequal in growth as a group of children they crowd together they stand apart they straggle but if they have any law it is the rivers they mark its path as reeds and rushes might do in meadows the hidden reaches are traced by this black growth followed and discovered the chimneys will hardly let the river go but cling to the track of his waters when the town is dwindling eastwards and stand conspicuous among the flats when the houses have at last at last ceased apart from the river they are almost as rare in london as in naples and it is not to them we owe the chief part of our sky but to the steamers to the trains and more than all to the unnumbered houses if ever london is to be restored to her own mists not to great brightness but to the tender exhalations that are now burlesqued by smoke to the true climate of nature the marshes and the north it will obviously be the work of laws touching the houses rather than the factories the river is perpetually overhung involved tangled in that indefinite and unshapely cloud it looks blue from the greenwich hill but not blue with the blaze of pure sunny waters it is blue because blue is the trick of this midsummer light seen from this one point the blue road lies open and flat from the dazzling confusion of the west whence it comes to the dimmer confusion of the north whither the great curve tends it is a road more level than the tyrannously level rails but there is no haste in it the unceasing motion of the tidal thames seems to make it wait about the bridges of london the accustomed versifier himself will hardly bid it flow on so often it is seen to flow back because it is so constantly chidden and driven by the sea the long tendency brought from its first source and kept between so many fields and over all the noisy weirs is concealed that flowing lurks still but you cannot find it among the rhythmic tides it is not expressed and there is no sense of the final sea in the coming and going of these turbid waters the unceasing seaward flow is their secret but it is only upon this ambiguous road of the river that any human motion is perceptible in this distant view barges are seen to flow heavy and flat and at certain points there is the vague suggestion of some stir at wharf or pier otherwise the scene keeps all its hurry out of sight and hearing but for the vague shifting and alteration of the light london might be a painted city the little figure of man is so quenched incredibly his town keeps the black crowds and their voices out of reach and it is difficult to believe in the noise so deaf is the distance london is at the mercy of her roads and it is no wonder the fancy should give them life and now it is for their coming not their going that they seem in haste the town has covered up the original and all fruitful earth her pavements seal up all the springs of earthly life and her roads are loaded with the fruits of earth unsealed it is upon her then that the roads are turned with boat train and cart charged with her bread what flocks and herds are daily hunted into the unproductive town 
the town where from nothing nothing for all its factories takes birth the town that visibly burns up with never-ceasing reek of the never-ceasing burning the substance of the world the flame of life is fed fully in a thousand forms and the flame of fire smouldering in the furnaces at the foot of the chimneys is the sign of the enormous sacrifice end of chapter nine recording by greg giordano newport ritchie florida chapter ten of london impressions this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by michael fascio london impressions by alice maynell chapter ten chapter ten the smouldering city because the town covers her fires, sits darkling in her daily and nightly burning, and sequesters flame from flame in a thousand thousand little chambers of their own, there is but small show of the perpetual devouring whereby fire abides among men as a long companion. Ariel of a hotter name and of a wilder element, willing and brief, delicate and eager, quick to finish and be gone, a hasty servant, is fire the mere visitant, unused to these long hours. But fire in London never escapes. It is bound in perpetual business, and if it flashes away for a moment it is recaptured in another flash, and if it slips away under the cover of ashes it is overtaken and bound to the task again. Man, then, willingly pays the wages of such a wildness in servitude, and spends mines and forests to keep the mobile creatures close within its gates. If there is little show of that multitudinous presence, there is a broadcast sign of it. No smoke without a fire, and the sky of London continually betrays her housemate. It is the flag signaling the presence of the unseen creature, not by color and brilliance like its own, but by a folding and unfolding of banners of darkness. The quicker and hotter the enclosed fire, the duller is the sign. It is a sign that denies and confesses at once. Not a curl of flame, not a glow of furnace is visible under the hurrying blackness of riverside smoke that hangs house and wall with the gray tokens of invisible and splendid flame. Fire is the blush, and when London shows color it is the cool red, not the hot. Such color has been all alight on many midsummer evenings. Hardly a town away from these dark latitudes could show a fresher or fuller flash of dyes. A colored sky, a colored sun, colored cloud, the red of brick softly empurpled, or made rosy, or turned a frolic scarlet, and the green of trees yet undarkened by the later days of summer, all this stirs and lightens under the soft hurry of a west wind, so that a drive between seven and eight o'clock is a surprise of red and blue. White is wanting, the white surface that would look beautiful in western sunshine. All the white is bad and unfortunate, whether it is the paint of Regent Street or the stucco of suburbs, and where there is no beauty of white there must be much lacking. It is grotesque to find the silly oil-paint gloss of the quadrant glazing back the tender sun, where one looked for white made luminous. Seldom does the country landscape fail, especially where it is gently populous, to hold up some tempered white to the rosy sun, where there is no chalk or white quarry or cliff, or white hawthorn tree or white cherry. There is the welcome whitewash of a cottage wall. London, undecked with its white, and wearing little or no yellow, has nevertheless a choice of these kindling reds of her various bricks, and so decked with the colors of fire she is at her freshest. It is as when you touch the red of a deep cheek and find it cool. The general fire has no part in the colored evening, 
that sunny wind blows the sign of flame away. In the thicket of fire there is no red brick, or green tree, or rosy cloud, or any light blue sky. Those who find something to complain of in the rebuilding of the west of London and brick, because the architecture is not everywhere what it should be, are hardly thankful enough for the color. The builder may build amiss, but he builds with a color that has become all our skies, whether gray or bright. One day he will, perhaps, begin a fashion of using much more white in brick and tile, and the fiery town will look relieved from her suggestion of fever. Ruddy roofs abound in the poorer town, where red walls are absent. They are built up with gray and black, needless to say, in such a manner that their old gables are hidden in square frontages and straight cornices, and their colors made invisible except to a view from above. It is from a high railway that you may see the darkened but still soft and charming color spreading from roof to roof of the cottage streets of older London, until it looks, fading eastwards, as though it were itself some effect of a London sunset. That flush almost reaches the regions of the red-hot eastern furnaces hidden coldly under black and gray. The waters of the Thames could hardly quench so great a multitude of imprisoned flames. Fire is the secret of the Thames itself, lurking as it does in the ships and boats. The black barges are charged to feed it, and the airs that wander with the river fan it to its perpetual work. It is trained within its little shrines, and leaps in chains in captivity, and runs in narrow courses. With its cold ashes and its cold grime, with the burden of its chill refuse, all the remote roads and byways of the town seem to be utterly choked and filled. When the great fire of London came out of its hiding places and took life in the air of day, it made ashes of more evident and conspicuous things, but it can hardly have made more ashes and cinders than it makes daily under cover. London is not destroyed again, but it has become the place of immeasurable destruction. Moreover, since the smouldering city is a city of men, the life of men so multiplied makes London a very centre of fires insatiable. That life burns within five millions of furnaces. Life feeds itself by fire, but out of London we are accustomed to see it at its consuming work side by side with the signs of unceasing recreation. Man, woman, and child, sprinkled over the laboring land, are separate flames far apart like the marsh flames of wildfire. Between them graze the sheep, the wheat turns brown, or the apple reddens and the husbandman's life itself is immediately paid again in labor to the soil. Whereas London visibly works at nothing but transformation. The delicate fire that plays and vanishes elsewhere, but cannot vanish in London, has nowhere else so gross and dead a following. Even in the north, where the factory makes a denser cloud, you find the blue close by, and the horizon cleaner, or so it seems little distant things on the verge, the lashes of the eyes of earth and sky, are more perceptible than they are in London, even with a west wind. Here the fiery aerial has no delicate companionship. No one near but Caliban. End of chapter 10